As something of an amateur anthropologist, I've long had a special interest in the people living in Wufong Township, located in the mountains of Taiwan Shinju County. On the 1st of December 2012, I accepted an invitation to attend the Pastaai Festival, held by the indigenous Saisha people living in Daai Village. The Saisha, numbering approximately 5,000, speak an Austronesian language and are culturally related to groups living on islands throughout the Pacific, from New Zealand in the south to Hawaii in the east. Like other Austronesian groups on Taiwan, who collectively make up just 2% of Taiwan's population of more than 23 million, the Saisha engaged in headhunting until the imposition of Japanese colonial rule in the early years of the 20th century. Today, the Saisha people peacefully live alongside another indigenous group, the more numerous Atayal, as well as descendants of immigrants from China. Many of the Saisha have moved away from their traditional territory to obtain education and pursue job opportunities in the cities. This migration has led to a decline in the importance of traditional customs and the use of their language. One way that the Saisha sustain their cultural identity is by celebrating their traditional festivals. The Pastai festival is the most well-known of these, and it attracts Saisha living in both Wufong as well as the adjacent township of Nanjuang. Also present are family members who have moved to Taiwan cities and visitors from Taiwan and abroad. The Pastai festival is a rite of atonement on behalf of the Saisha for an act of revenge perpetrated by one of their ancestors against the residents of a nearby village. According to legend, the Saisha came to Wufong when their homes and lands to the southwest were destroyed in a flood. The Da'ai, a short, dark-skinned people living in caves high on a riverside cliff, befriended the Saisha and taught them to survive in their unfamiliar environment. They showed them which plants to collect in the forest, the best places to hunt and fish, and which crops would grow on the steep hillsides. In the evenings, the Da'ai, who possessed magical powers, would come to the Saisha village to socialize around the campfire with their neighbors. However, they were attracted to the Saisha women, and utilizing their invisibility, they repeatedly molested them. One night, a Saisha man of the Ju tribe saw a Da'ai man seducing a Saisha woman. Angered by this, he hatched a plan of revenge. Hastening to the log bridge used by the Da'ai when they returned to their own village, he cut the vines holding the log. When the Da'ai were crossing the bridge at the end of the evening, the log gave way, casting the Da'ai to their death in the whirlpools of the river below. The only survivors of the attack, the elders Da'ai and Teowai, put a curse on the Saisha, withering their crops chasing away the animals of the forest and killing the people. Fearing that his group would be wiped out, Ju apologized to the elders and begged their forgiveness. The Da'ai elders took pity on the Saisha and instructed Ju in a ritual that the entire group would have to perform to honor the Da'ai people. Failure to do so would be catastrophic for the Saisha. Today, that festival is celebrated every two years with three nights of singing and dancing according to the rites laid down by Da'ai and Teowai and communicated to Ju. The elders of the Ju clan host the festival known as Pas Da'ai in the Saisha language in an arena constructed in Da'ai village. The floor of the arena is packed earth and it is surrounded on one side by rows of concrete benches that ascend the hillside. On the concrete steps are seated groups of people, sharing snacks and bottles of rice wine brewed in the surrounding villages. On the other, long open-sided sheds house food stalls that have been set up for the festival. In the four corners of the arena, campfires burn next to large stacks of wood, soaking the entire arena in the smell of smoke. The mood is festive and at times boisterous, but the dancing and singing is overseen by elders who ensure that the proper rites are observed. The arena is filled with people in the early hours of the evening. Many are wearing the traditional Saisha dress of a long woven jacket or dress in red and black, 
and decorated with white buttons over their normal clothing. Around the outside of the ring, participants rest, chat with friends, and share bowls and cups of rice wine. Inside the arena, a long line of Saisha, their arms entwined, dance slowly forward and back. At the head of the line are the singers, chanting the songs taught to Jew by the Da'ai elders. The words of these songs are not in the Saisha language, but are instead from the language of the Da'ai. Next come the dancers, wearing decorated boards on their back that have chains of bells hanging from them. This apparatus is known as tapangasan, or hip bells, and as the dancers move their hips in unison, the bells shake and ring in a hypnotic rhythm. This custom is unique among Taiwan's Austronesian people. Dancing around the circle of people in the ring are men carrying tall, fan-shaped objects on their shoulders. These are known as kilakil, or moon flags. Up to 1.5 meters in height, they have frames made of bamboo. Their outside surface is covered in brightly colored cloth or strips of aluminum, flashing lights and bells. The men carrying the moon flags bounce up and down as they dance, their bells ringing at a more energetic tempo than the hip bells. Many photographers and other visitors are circling the dancers in the arena, but they are careful not to enter the circle. The area within is reserved for the short people. The Saisha believe that their spirits return to Da'ai to witness the ritual that is being performed in their honor. At one point, quite late in the evening, I was approached by a woman of the Chen clan. She offered me a cup of rice wine. She was accompanied by a younger male relative carrying a 5-liter plastic bottle full of rice wine. He used this to refill the cups of wine that the woman urged people to drink. As she offered the wine with her right hand, she used her left to support the drinker's neck as the head was tipped back and the cup drained. No one refused her hospitality. And if they were unlucky enough to spill any, she scolded them for their carelessness. Here, a father and his son share a cup of wine, drinking from it at the same time, a custom shared by many of Taiwan's Austronesian groups, but never practiced by Taiwan's Chinese inhabitants. Late in the evening, once my inhibitions had been lowered by the rice wine, I put away my video camera and joined in the dancing. As the morning began to dawn, the effects of the long night of drinking could easily be seen. A few people had passed out, but most simply staggered around in good humor. I can't say how the festival ended the night I attended. I retired to the back of a roadside stall where I had stored my backpack. There in my sleeping bag next to friends and theirs, I slept until the pounding of the rain on the tin roof above woke me. I returned to the arena to find it empty, the rain pooling on the earthen floor. I returned to Taipei that afternoon, thankful for the opportunity to share in the Saisha's remarkable celebration of Pasta Eye. <laughs>